be baptized. Show the world you're in. Okay, so if that's you today, that you've been on this journey and you've never quite got round to it, consider it. Talk to Tom, talk to anybody really, and they'll go, yes, do it. Okay, you don't have to have a long preparation. You do have to have a heart that says yes to God. And I'm sure if you, if you speak to him about it, you haven't been baptized, uh, then you may be considering it now. So that's baptism. The other thing is, we ran out of booklets. 19th. Sorry, didn't I tell you? It was the 19th. There you go. Right. Of March. The 19th of March. Okay. So you haven't got that long. All right. It would be great. So Tom, come back. All is forgiven. All right. He does this. The other thing uh, we've got is... We've managed to produce some more membership booklets. We ran out because so many people wanted them. So we've got some more now. They're at the back. They're out there as well. Or you can come and get one personally from Tom or from any, uh, anyone else. They'll run and get you one. So that's those. Third thing is uh, we've, someone has found uh, a silver ring okay, just outside. If anyone's lost one, let us know. Otherwise, it's going in the lost property. All right, And it will be auctioned later. No. No. <laughs> Okay, so that's that. Okay, this morning we started off with, uh, in the prayer meeting with Psalm 133. And I want to use that as an introduction to our worship today. Psalm 133 is part of a larger body of psalms called the Songs of Ascents. Okay, these were individual psalms that were put together and used in liturgy. All right, and it starts off with people far away from God in Psalm 120, and it goes all the way to Psalm 135. And they put these together, called them the Songs of Ascent, and it was about a journey towards God. And in that journey, they go all the way across a desert and up the mountains to the temple of God for an encounter with him. And they put these together in their liturgy. And there were 15 steps up from the holy place to the holy of holies in the temple. So what they did is, to represent this journey, they went to the bottom step and they did the first psalm. And then they went to the next step and they did the next psalm. And then they did the next step and they did the next psalm. And each, at each point, they paused and said, we're on a journey. We're getting closer to God. So Psalm 133 is near the top. Near the top. You're about to encounter God. And you'd think it would be a long psalm. You know, because if you're getting close to God, you get verbal diarrhea. But it's not. It says this. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. You see, the closer you get to God, the more our relationships matter. You can't get there and be angry with your brother, your sister, your wife, your kids, your parents. You've got to be at peace. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. For their the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Got that? We're coming to worship our God. And I know one or two of you have had fights, even this morning, even in the kitchen. All right, you've even had a go at your children, parents, whatever. Let's put that right. So what I want you to do is this. I want you to say sorry to the people you need to say, say sorry to, okay? But to cover that, all right, I also want you to go and give your peace to others. Just shake their hand and say, God's peace on you. Got that? So a little bit of apologies and so on. And then we'll come back to our seats and then we'll pray together and we'll worship our God. How's that sound? Okay.
Stand up. Wander around. You know. Peace be with you, mate. Okay. Have a, good, have a good morning. Thank you, and you. Okay. I hope you've done your blessing. Now, peace be with you. Okay. If we can take our places, that would be good. I know some of you need to do a lot of apologies. Okay, let's stand together, please. Should we stand together? <laughs> and let us pray together. Lord, we have made our peace with others. And we approach the throne of God. And ask for your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace that we might enter clean before a holy God because Jesus has wiped away the stain of sin. We praise you for him. We give you thanks for your grace paid for on a cross and triumphed over with a resurrection. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Lord, we do give you thanks that we have promises in Jesus. Promises that you fulfill because you love us. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Um, so we're going to do this slightly differently today um, to normal. So we're going to have Adventure, Discover and Explore going out first. Um, so if you are in one of those groups, Adventure, you're in the back room, Discover, you're upstairs and Explore, you're just meeting down the side passage here. Um, now just before you go, I just want to say um, there's been so many visitors to the church recently, which has been so great. If you are visiting, can you make sure that as well as going out with your child to, f- um, to drop them off, you fill in their name and details that the leaders will give you um, the sheet for as you as you take them out um, so if you're in adventure discover and explore if you could go out now that'd be great um, off you go you guys just Um, and as Adventure, Discover and Explore go out, I'm just going to pray over these children that they would just learn so much about who you are today. I pray for a blessing over these leaders that have given their time um, to serve these children today. I just pray that they would be such amazing sessions, such fun, um, and that they would just be learning more and more about who you are. Yes, God, we pray that over these children today and over the youth who are about to go out as well. Amen. Um, Okay, so it's time for Connect and Encounter to go out. Now, for Connect and Encounter, um, if you are if you are on the registers and you've been lots of times before, you can just go out. But again, if you're new, um, please, parents or carers, could you go out and um, write the details down if you aren't on the register already? Thank you. Off you go. Let's worship together again, and um, I'll leave some gaps between these songs so that uh, people can pray as well, so we'll leave some gaps, so please feel free to pray.
Just one word. You measure the mountains in your hand, yet you treasure the broken and make them.
thank you for this grace given to us. And Lord, we want you to pour that grace out on others. And so we bring to you our prayers for our homes, for our families, for our country, for our nations, for those in difficulty throughout the world, that they might hear good news of a God who loves them. We pray especially for the people of Ukraine and ask for your mercy and your peace. We pray for the people of Syria and Turkey. Lord, have mercy. Help us to be your hands, your voice. that the world might know there is a compassionate God because he makes compassionate people in the name of Christ. Lord, we lift up our world in all its joys and sorrows and we ask that you reveal Christ that people might be fulfilled and at peace and with joy in their souls. And we might produce a society that reflects your grace and your goodness. Lord, hear our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andy. Now, we are about to start a new series in Ephesians. So I thought I'd get Gillian to come up and read Ephesians to us so that we get the whole picture. So up you come, Gillian. So Ephesians, New Testament, uh, if you want to get a Bible, there's one over there, there's one at the back, there's even ones in Ukrainian, which I do not understand whatsoever, uh, and I don't understand even the, the, um, the letters, but apparently this says um, Bible in, in Ukrainian, so if you'd like one of those, if you want to keep it, do so. Uh, the church would love you to have a Bible so that you can read to your heart's content and encounter God through it. So, Gillian, read us Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. That's all we're looking at today. <laughs> we're going to introduce this uh, study of Ephesians. And um, can I move this on? Oh, I can. Look at this. Modern technology is a wonderful thing as long as it works. So there we are. Is that it? We're starting a new series uh, on, on togetherness. And we're going to move through Ephesians. We thought, the, we thought this would be a, a great way for us to move forward together in our mission. So the problem is sometimes you want to start again. You know, some people even move to another church because of all the mistakes they've made. Some people want to move to a new marriage or a new family because of all the mistakes they've made. But God doesn't do that kind of thing. He starts where you are. So this is a new start without starting again. Because, you know, the danger is, you know, when there's a little child, you know, they get a piece of paper, they start drawing. If they make a mistake, what do they do? They sort of scrunch it up, throw it on the floor and start with a new piece of paper. You go through reams of stuff. Because they keep making a mistake and thinking the only way 
to do it is to start again. But God doesn't do that. He doesn't say, oh, I've started with you, but I've made a mess, or you've made a mess, so I'll throw you out and start with somebody else. Aren't you glad that he keeps starting again? He starts anew, and he says, I will not give up on you. So this is a new start without starting anew. The problem is, you, you know, as a church, you can have a mission statement to bridge the gap between us and the community, to bless the world through God's grace, through, love, through his love and through his justice, and to build Christians. Great mission statement. You can have clear values on how to get there through encounters with God. Isn't that great? Through everyone being valued and included and through excellence in communication. You can have all of those things and yet you can still feel we're not ready. We're not ready. I mean, yes, it's a great mission statement, but, but we're not at the start line yet. We need to put a few things in place first. We need to get some more things right first. Like, we know, the quality of our love, for instance, or the communication, or the leadership, or whatever. And there's always reason to delay. It's like the, the person uh, giving advice to travelers who, who had lost their way touring Ireland. And they, they, they ask a local, how do you get to Dublin? And he leans into the car and he goes, whoa. He says, Dublin, whoa, that's a long way. You know, if I were going to Dublin, I wouldn't start from here. <laughs> so often, we as church members can give the same advice. If you're going to reconcile Rutland to the kingdom of God, you wouldn't start here. You'd start somewhere else. So you can still feel we're not ready, but you can also feel like you're on the outside looking in. You know, the church has got this great mission, but I'm sort of out here, not quite included. Maybe because of my age, maybe because of my circumstances, maybe because, you know, my, my family aren't all Christians. You can always think of reasons, and it makes you feel as though you're not part of it. Is, is that just me doing that, or is that you as well? You know, you can feel on the outside. Other people are having a great fellowship, but somehow you miss it. You know, they have fantastic worship on the day you don't turn up. And encounters with God. It's as if there's something missing, not from the church, but from you. On the outside, looking in. There's not the urgency, there's not the passion for this mission in you. And you're wondering, even if you should be involved. Well, I've got good news for you. Ephesians was written for you. Because it doesn't say... Go back and start again. Because obviously you've taken a wrong turn somewhere. It doesn't say, I wouldn't start from here, where you are. It says to every Christian, start where you are. Start where you are. I know, it's terrible, isn't it? You'd rather start from somewhere else. See, God wants you to understand some simple things. He wants to un you to understand your new life, your new society, your new standards. Your new life is where you stand with God. Your new society is, is how do you, re you relate to other Christians. And they're an odd bunch, aren't they? I mean, just look around. Go on, have a look. They're a real odd bunch. How you relate to other Christians. Your new standards. How you behave in the world. How am I going to behave now that I have Christ? And your renewed relationships. How 
Your life in Christ affects your relationships in the home, in work, and in society. And it does. These are in Christ. In Christ together. In Christ's kingdom. From Christ's kingdom. And from Christ's perspective. And that's what Ephesians tackles. How do you take the remake that's happened in your soul and let it come out? So Ephesians is written for you to say, look, you can do this. Not because you're great, but because God is. And his, his work is a total makeover. You see, it says, starting from here, God wants to bless you. And for some of you, and for me sometimes, I don't think that's true. Sometimes I think God's got to do some, oh, I've got to do something first, and then God will bless me. God, if he was waiting for that, he'd, make, he'd wait till the kingdom come, wouldn't he? He doesn't wait to bless you, but he can bless you better if you acknowledge him. And the key to God wanting to bless you is very simple. Know Christ better. That's it. Know Christ better. You're having fights with your husband or your wife. Know Christ better, and he'll show you how to deal with it. You're having trouble with your children. Know Christ better. And you'll know how to deal with them. It may not solve the immediate problems, but knowing Christ better will give you that peace in your heart. Know Christ better is the answer that Paul has. If you want spiritual blessings, know Christ better. He doesn't say read your Bible, pray every day, and that will work. That's just a tool. Because you can do all of that and not know Christ better. You can go through, how many of you have done this? You've gone through, I've done my daily reading, boom, down. All right, I've done my prayers, done, down. As if somehow you're trying to earn brownie points with God. Doesn't work, does it? What does work is knowing Christ better. It's when you open your Bible and say, show me Jesus. Show me myself. Let him in. You know Christ better, and somehow the peace of God enters you, the grace of God starts to come out of you. And you're gracious to horrible people, and you're surprised at yourself. God, I've been very gracious to them. Even your spouse is surprised at you. God, you didn't blow up at that motorist who cut you up. I know Christ better and he's given me grace to forgive even though they are stupid <laughs> and they ate my piece of road which I paid for. Know Christ better. If you want spiritual mastery, know Christ better. If you want your prayers answered, it's not a formula. It's simply this, know Christ better. Because then you'll start shaping your prayers around his will and how he would pray. And you know what? Sometimes Jesus doesn't want people healed. Did I really say that? Sometimes he's doing a bigger work through cancer, through difficulty, than you could imagine by saying, Lord, heal them. He wants to bring them to that point where they acknowledge Christ and worship him even in their pain. Do you get that? Know Christ better and you'll stop just doing those blanket prayers. Oh, there, there, make everything better, Lord. Oh, don't, don't, don't let anyone be hurt any time ever. You'll be praying, Lord, 
Use this to bring you glory. Use this to show Jesus. And can I be your hands and your voice in doing this? Can I do that for you? Can I be the person that brings the presence of Christ? Know Christ better. If you want this spiritual mastery, that's what you do. If you want a higher moral life, you know, because you've been touching the porn and you've been, you've been doing other stuff and you're not proud of yourself, you won't do it by self-will alone. You know Christ better and gradually it just moves away from you because you do not want to interrupt that relationship with Christ. Know him better. If you want a fulfilled life, know Christ better. If you want better relationships, even the one with your spouse and your children, know Christ better. And he will teach you all sorts of things. Men, he will teach you all sorts of stuff about women. And they're complicated. They really are. Okay? He didn't give them an on-off switch. You won't find one. I mean, women, you know that men are simple, all right? But God made women complicated to make sure that men stayed interested. You know, I mean, if it was an on-off switch, then they got, oh, I'd do that any time. But they're not like that. And God made us to complement one another. And if you want to know more, don't get books of psychology out. Know Christ better and you will know what intimacy is really like. And you can share that with your spouse. It's different. Do you married couples know what I'm talking about here? Do you understand that? It affects every relationship. Paul talks about that in Ephesians. Husbands and wives. So that's his secret. Now, if you just want to be rich and overindulged and lazy, keep Jesus at arm's length. You can do that because he'll let you. He still loves you, but you're an idiot. You'll become disillusioned and lonely and confused and frustrated and you'll never know if people love you or they're just attached to your stuff or your looks. But if you know Christ better, wow, you find you are truly loved, not just by Jesus, but by others. Hey, it's your choice. But Paul comes in in this letter and he says, know Christ better. It's the key to you unlocking life. So let me go through some of this Ephesians 1, 1 and 2, if I could. Ah, there it is. The key is knowing Christ better there. Let me look at Ephesians for you. This is a concise but comprehensive summary of the Christian good news and its implications. That's what it is. Paul's writing this letter and he's saying, this is what, and this is what he says, what you believe matters. But what you put into practice makes a real difference. And how you do that changes everything. That's his message in Ephesians. And he's going to cover all sorts. But he starts with Christ because some of you have a lower opinion of Christ than you should. Do it right and life is a gift even though it can be a struggle. Do it, don't do it right and life is a confused struggle and you'll be confused all the way to your deathbed. And God doesn't want that. He wants something better for you so that you can rejoice as Abraham did and as Isaac did, and as Jacob did, leaning on your staff and worshipping God. The man, I mean, Jacob was crippled. Isaac was blind. 
for the last 20 years of his life. And yet, they worshipped God. They didn't blame God for 20 years for poor eyesight and a bad leg. Because they knew their God. And you can do the same. Know Christ better and you will see the God of grace in your life. Even Paul, he had an eye problem, didn't he? And he said, you know, I know that you would pluck your own eyes out and give them to me if you could. But I have learned that my grace is sufficient for you. And you, you people that are content in the Lord, isn't that what you've learned? Despite your ailments, despite your family problems, isn't that what you've learned? My grace is sufficient for you. Some of you are smiling and going, hmm, I don't know about that. But that's what we learn together. God's grace will see you through. So, Ephesians. The letter starts with love. Now, Paul could have started the letter many ways. He could have said, uh, you Ephesians, you ain't got it right. Well, he could have, because they hadn't. All right? He could have said, you don't esteem Christ enough, you terrible church. How horrible of you. Get it right, you idiots. Otherwise, I'm not sure about your place in heaven. He doesn't say that. You know, he goes to Corinth. I'm, that's a really messed up church. And what does he do? You terrible church. Call yourself a church. No. He starts with love. Every letter that he writes, he starts with love. Do you know what he says to them? He's a terrible person, really. He comes to some churches and he goes, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the Corinthians had been doing incest. Some of them were taking each other to court. Some of them were coming to communion. Good grief. They're bringing their own picnic lunch and not sharing it. And saying, we are one body, but you can starve because I've got a lovely feast here. And Jesus comes, uh, Paul comes along and says, you know what? I've learned this. Grace and peace to you. He starts with an aspect of love. There are some people that come into churches and they're just angry. Do you know what I mean? There's always something wrong with the church. You church, that church, as if there's something terribly wrong with it, and they start complaining bitterly. Paul doesn't do that because he's got grace within him, and he sees the good. And the good news is this. These are Christians. They've given themselves to the Lord, but they're not following as closely as they could. And the key is grace of God. Know Christ better. He doesn't say you don't know Christ at all. He says you do know him. You've received him. But somehow you're not progressing. So know Christ better. And you'll be amazed at how this will change you. He says from me to you with love. From me, that's Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. I'm an apostle. Now, an apostle was one who was called and sent out. And this is what Jesus called the 12 in Luke 6. You're going to be my apostles. They're called by one specific party and they're sent out. And Paul says, that's me. Not called by the church, called by God. And I'm sent out. So that's me. That's who I am. In Jewish and rabbinic writings, an apostle was someone especially chosen who was called and sent to teach with authority, like Paul was when he went out to arrest Christians. He had his letter with him. I've been appointed. He knew what an apostle was because he'd been one for the Jews. And then he gets knocked off his horse. And Jesus says, 
get rid of that piece of paper. I've got another one. I want you to be an apostle for me. Called and sent out. It was not a voluntary role or a church appointment. It was by the will of God and came from his first encounter with Christ on the Damascus Road in Acts 9. That's who me is, says Paul. What about you? Who are you? And he says, you're the saints and the faithful. That's what he calls them, these Ephesians. To the saints and the faithful. This is a letter written to those who have believed in Jesus Christ and received the benefits of that belief. Saints are not an elite bunch of people like the Catholic Church claim. But those who accept the call to faith and put their beliefs into practice. Saints are set apart to God. The sanctified. Set apart to God. Not set apart from the world. Set apart to God. And God says, you're clean. You act like a clean person. God says, you're accepted. So you act like an accepted person. Not like an interloper. God says, you're special. You act like a special person. God says, you're holy. Set apart to God. Act like a person set apart for God's purposes. That's what these people were doing. They were faithful. And that's why this letter is so positive. We're being faithful as far as we can, as far as we know. And we don't know what's happening now. They were saints and faithful in Christ. They were not relying on their own goodness or, pro or progress, but on the love and sacrifice of Jesus in making them acceptable and clean and special and holy. You see what I mean about know Christ better? They were doing that to some extent. And Paul writes to them, I know you are. He's not saying you're doing it all wrong. He's saying, I know your heart because you've given it to Christ. But you're trying to do life with Christ as sort of an appendage rather than letting him all the way in. You're trusting him for salvation. You're trusting him for eternal life. But somehow when it comes to relationships and work and, and all sorts of other stuff, you're trying to do that on your own. Let him in. At Ephesus, in, in the text, is a little problem, okay? Uh, for those scholars amongst you, uh, it's not in the original, in some of the earliest manuscripts, P60 and so on, all right, which are the earliest manuscripts we've got. At Ephesus is missing. So I'm not going to talk to you about all the background of Ephesus. You'd be pleased with that, okay? Oh, because that helps us understand the whole letter. But if we just, we just talk about Ephesus, then you know, we look at Paul's journeys and so on. Uh, and we could go into all that as to why this was written and so forth, and what evidence it had beforehand. But the ad Ephesus isn't, isn't there in the earliest manuscripts, so I'm not going to talk about that much. Um, uh, less than 100 years later, Marcion calls this the letter to the Laodiceans. Okay? which is mentioned in Colossians 4.16. There were two letters that were sent at the same time, and both were delivered by Tychicus. It's Ephesians 6 and Colossians 4. If you want to have a look at this, you can do so. Some of you want the technical stuff, I know. But, you know, in it, and it says in Colossians, you read the letter to the Laodiceans, and the Laodiceans can read your letter. All right? And... Uh, if you're trying to obey Scripture, you try and find the letter to the Laodiceans to say, I've read it, Lord. All right. uh, but it may be this one. What we do know is this is part of scriptures, inspired by God to bring us to his throne and marvel at his provision. And so we read it, and it gives us a glimpse of Christ as he is now, seated far above all things, with everything under his feet, with rich grace exuding from his throne because of his completed work on the cross. It's a marvelous picture. And we'll get to that. Not today. 
It's written to Gentile Christians, those who were on the outside and excluded from the Old Testament covenant, but now included, even though they still felt on the outside because some of them looked down on them. The Jewish ones will look down on them a bit and say, well, you're in, but you're not really one of us. And Paul writes this letter there to them. If you don't feel like an insider by the end of chapter 3, Paul has failed in his purpose in writing. Because he just includes you. If you have accepted Christ, you are part of the body. And this is God's letter to every Christian who feels on the outside. Where do I get the love from? Well, that's the blessing. A blessing that Paul starts nearly all of his letters with. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul has been absolutely brilliant with this opening. You see, when Romans wrote to each other, they often wrote in Greek. And they would say, write their letter, like we write our letters and go, dear. Okay, We don't really mean dear, because you could be formal or whatever. You're not really calling someone dear, are you? Hello, dear. They used to write a letter, the the, the Romans and the Greeks, and they used to say, rejoice. Rejoice, I've written you a letter. It got to you. Rejoice. Obviously, they didn't have the post office. (laughs) Rejoice, I've given you a letter. So all of their letters were caritas. And Paul changed it to Gavis, just changed a couple of letters, and that means grace. And the Jews, when they wrote a letter, they never started with rejoice, no. The Jews, shalom, shalom. They do even now, shalom, peace. And Paul, he goes off. 14 years somewhere, and he strips the gospel down of all its Old Testament content and comes with these two thoughts. And he puts them together and he says, you know what? The gospel is just about grace and peace. Now, the Greeks have a way of writing things, okay? And the way that they write it and the way that we write it are different, okay? So, if two people had presents, here you go, and you were giving them to me, so up you come, and you're going to give me, all right, Andy and Andrew, that's good, isn't it, Andy and Andrew, are going to give me a mug and a microphone, okay? Thank you very much, a mug and a microphone. That's the way that we would do it in English. We would say, if I said, Andy and Andrew are going to give me a mug and a microphone, you would expect the mug to come from Andy and the microphone to come from Andrew, wouldn't you? All right? Like chocolates and flowers. Two people walk in. They brought you chocolates and flowers. You say, oh, that's nice of you. But you would do one, then the other, then the first gift, and then that second gift. Greeks don't do that. All right? When they write a letter... They go, Andy and Andrew have brought me a microphone and a cup. They do it the other way around. Okay, so when you say grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The grace comes through Christ and the peace comes from God. It's the other way round. Okay? It's called a chiasm. But that's how they do it. Thank you very much. All right? I still get the same two things, but the order from which they came is different. And Paul, when he's writing his letter, says, grace comes from Jesus Christ. He's the one that brings it to you. He's the free gift it comes to. The Father gives you the peace. You get peace with God. You get the peace of God. And you get the God of peace with you. 
because of the grace of Christ. It's all centered on that grace. You get the idea? Don't confuse the two. When you think of grace, grace, think of Christ. Because that's who brings it to you. That's who paid for it. That you might be free. So, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, God has goodwill towards you. Now, that's something you don't often think, especially with if you've sinned or you've just had a blazing row. He still has goodwill towards you. He's just that kind of God. And the thing is, so does Paul. He doesn't get angry with the church because they've missed it. He still starts with grace and peace. And you know, when you've had a fight at home, not that you would, of course, because you're Christians. <laughs> when you've had a fight at home, you know how you can change the temperature of the conversation? With grace, undeserved favor. You go and be nice. They'll hate it. Why are you being nice to me? But that's grace at work. And Paul comes in, he says, this lovely church that's just going off the boil. Grace and peace to you. Know Christ better. And we can move on together. And we can be together and not do the infighting. And we can be part of the same team. God has good will to us. I know that there are many preachers that are angry with the church. Paul isn't because he's learned grace and peace. He's learned that God has been gracious to him and he has the peace of God within him and that changes his outlook. By the end of the letter, we should know that if we want spiritual blessings or spiritual mastery or answered prayers or a higher moral life or how to be a better ambassador of Christ, the key and only step, the first step, the last step, is knowing Christ better. There's just one path. And by the end, we should know our contributions do matter, intellectually, theoretically, and practically, in church, in your home, at work, and in the community. Your contribution matters. How you treat people matters because you're an ambassador of Christ. And by the end, you should feel more included. This includes me. I'm not an also-ran. I'm not a failed Christian. I'm just one that needs to know Christ better. And this kingdom, this journey, will roll on with grace and peace. Not judgment and competition. Imagine everyone being gracious to you today. Imagine people just giving you peace, that shalom, that presence of God. That's the church of Christ at work. From, from the start, you should know that God has goodwill towards you. He wants you to overcome your sin with his help. He wants you to rely on his grace in faith. And he wants you to rest in his peace and cease striving to prove your worthiness for salvation. Because you ain't worth it. But he has got grace to cover that. So my prayer and my hope for us is that we might know Christ better. And be re-energized in our walk with God so that each of us, including you, will join in God's wonderful mission to reconcile Rutland to the kingdom of God. Would you do that? Do you want to join me and Tom and the leaders on this journey? Do you really? 
Well, get baptized if you haven't been baptized. Come into membership and let's do this journey together. And I promise you, you will have support from a loving community, won't they? Because we're all scumbags saved by the grace of God in Christ. Let's stand together. Lord, we come before you. You know us. You know where we are and what we do. And you know our backgrounds and our history and everything else. And we cry out to you and say, I want to know Christ better. Teach me that I might be a better human being. better in my relationships and better at being an ambassador for Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Andy.
knowing Christ is not a quick fix, but a long-term solution. May God's grace and peace be with each one of us on that journey. Amen. Amen. Tea and coffee through there. Do bring it back. There's even biscuits and other beverages are available. God bless. <laughs>